Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we are discussing the American holiday, holiday that has overtaken all others and the force that drives it. That is Black Friday and consumerism. Consumerism. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking $30,000 Millionaire. From the Noble Ray Brewing Company in Dallas, Texas. Mm. This is a 6.7%. Uh, ABV. ABV, yeah. I just stopped in the middle of that because I got looking at this funky <laughs> can here. This is bizarre. It is an odd can. Um, $30,000 millionaire. I'm just going to call it douchebag because of the the, the picture on yeah. it. Uh, well, what does that even mean, $30,000 millionaire? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I think the can describes it rather well, actually. <laughs> well, I, I actually like that because I think it leads into the show. And I think that what it's essentially trying to say is on $30,000 um, or something like that, trying to live the life of a millionaire. And I think that's something that a lot of I mean, that's the whole keeping up with the Joneses kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 spiel. Well, and, and uh, you know, we, we, we live in a time when it's, when it's unacceptable now, and, and I think for good reason. Uh, but there was a much more racist term for the same thing when I was growing up. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, so, Hood but rich? I, I, huh? Hood rich? N- no, that, well, that's not the one I heard, but that, oh. I guess that could, oh. that could be used as well. Yeah. Uh, Pro- much preferably. Oh. <laughs> okay. I see now. So we're talking uh, about consumerism and uh, kind of kind of because of it's Black Friday coming up here. Right. What's the direction you want to go with this, John? Uh, well, you know, I, I want to you know start with a little bit of history and and talk about how we got where we are, what consumerism is, and then I kind of want to pontificate and philosophize a little bit about should we be there? Done that on the show before. No, it's been a while. We, we, it's <laughs> been a while. We, we pontificate a lot, but not on the show. Uh, yeah. Is it messy? <laughs> well, sometimes. So, uh, I guess, you know, <coughs> to get started, and I probably should have had this up all right already, but I want to do... Uh, shoot, I'm trying to stall and I'm misspelling. Um, I want to look at a definition. So, pulling up on Google... Um, consumerism is the protection or promotion of the interests of consumer. I don't think that's the one we're looking for. It's a pretty bad definition. Yeah. Um, the preoccu- Oh, here, here we go. This is, this is the one that we're looking for. The preoccupation of society with the acquisition of consumer goods. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. uh, the fact that everybody wants everything now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's I think that's what our you know our society's been built on in a lot of ways. It, yeah, consumer goods being those that aren't necessary for survival. Well, isn't yeah. that like capitalism? I yeah. mean, well, I, I think they're associated a lot, but I don't necessarily think they're they're synonymous. Uh, I, th- I think capitalism has has at its root uh, the production and and seeking of wealth, whereas consumerism has to do with the consumption of resources. And while capitalism does drive on the supply side off of consumerism on the demand side, I think they are distinct. I don't know that they are. I think think that's what the invisible hand is. It's it, it's greed. It's the fact that you that, that that you always want more that drives it. Well, I agree. I agree. But I I I, I think they're distinct in the same way that a motor and a car are not the same thing. They are parts that work together. Yeah, yeah. And, and they they, they kind of need each other to some extent, but I don't think that they are necessarily identical. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I think that's I think it's a fair way to look at it. Yeah. Um. You want to start off talking about this guy, uh, uh, and I can't even say his name very well. Uh, uh, Bernay Minville. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, but before we get into that, I, I, I want to give people kind of a foundation uh, for his work because uh, I think what a lot of people don't realize is for most of human history, this was not the norm. Uh, people actually owned very few possessions. Yeah, the yeah. average person, uh, nobility, obviously owned a lot more until but, the 1700s, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, people they had their shelter, uh, which they may or may not have owned. Um, they probably didn't. Yeah, they had a minimal amount of clothes that yeah. they they could you know wash and use as needed. Uh, they had one that was clean and one that they wore usually. <laughs> yeah, 
they had some farming implements, uh, some light furniture, you know, a bed or, or something like that. Whatever they made, probably. Uh, maybe a broom, you know, for cleaning the house. But, you know, uh, you know when, when consumerism really starts, uh, the things that people start owning are things we almost take for granted. A mirror, a yeah. comb. Mm-hmm. You know, these kinds of very basic things that we think of now as just, you know, of course everyone has that, were kind of their luxuries at the time. Yeah, yeah. And a it, toilet it, in the house. Yeah, and it grows from there and, and kind of at one point explodes and, and gets out of control. This is this is the period in time, and, and probably you can put a year to it, when we start seeing pineapples be exorbitantly expensive. We start yeah, seeing yeah. wigs so tall you have to stand on a ladder to put it on someone's head. Like It, it very quickly like goes up and, and explodes into this ridiculous stuff and then kind of calms down a little bit. So... Uh, it, it goes it goes back and forth, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, with that kind of foundation and understanding, do do you want to take off with... Yeah, I, you, know, you know, we always kind of associate uh, uh, capitalism and, and, and this with, with the invisible hand. You know, mm-hmm. the, the idea of, uh, you, you know, that, that, that the markets are driven by this greed. And uh, we, we frequently give credit for that to, to Adam Smith. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 70 years before Adam Smith com- comes out with this idea, this guy, Bernard Mendeville, uh, who was actually a Dutchman living in London at the time, Bernard Mendeville wrote a poem called The Fable of the, of the Bees. Uh, I remember reading it in college, and, and when you brought it up to me, John, I, I, uh, I said, yeah, I, I'm familiar with that, but it's been a long time. And I, I spent some time this morning reading on it a, a little bit more detail. This poem was actually pretty controversial. It was first published in 1705. Uh, and it starts off with this, this story of this powerful beehive that, that controls everything. And as you read the poem, about the second stanza, you realize that it's a metaphor for the British Empire at the time. And the whole concept of this is that what, what he talks about here is how this, this hive was the envy of, of the world, but there was vice there, there were people that had all these uh, these sins and the, they committed these vices, particularly greed. That was mm-hmm. that was the big one, and people kept ask, kept saying, uh, you know, how how can, how can these people be so 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 viceful? How can they be so greedy? How can they have so many sins? And they, there's a point in the poem where they they pray, they we just just let us get rid of this vice and everything will be fine. And suddenly, vice was gone. And if you read the poem. They start talking about the problems that come whenever you get rid of when you get rid of vice and avarice. Uh, the doctors begin admitting that that they, they really don't know how to how, how to cure you, mm-hmm. so they just stop trying, and yeah. people get sick. Uh, police officers, judges, lawyers are out of work because nobody's committing a crime, uh, and and there's all these cases where where people are accepting of just enough, where they no longer need. Uh, need the consumerism of everything, and they start accepting the simplicities of life. And this once great hive, again the metaphor for the British Empire, mm-hmm. collapses in on itself because there's there's no avarice to to fuel the growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at the very end of it, there these these two people walking through the uh, walking through the woods, and they see a couple of bees there, and they're just flying around the woods. And they said something to the effect of. Imagine that this was once the leader of the woods, and now this is all that's left of it. So it was the whole poem is this this metaphor that you you can't have the success of capitalism without greed and avarice. Well, and I, I want to talk a little bit put put this in its timeline because what he was responding to at the time was actually the church because while this uh, explosion and consumer- part of it was yeah yeah while this explosion and consumerism was happening. Uh, there was a big push by the church um, to cast off your worldly possessions. You don't need all this extra stuff that that people are are are, are falling to, and it's it's all you know drenched in sin. And what you should yeah, it's really getting in the way of your worship. Yeah, what you should really be doing is spending more time in church and giving all these worldly possessions to the church, or at least the money that you're using to yeah. buy them, uh, because that's what's going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. I think largely at this time, this is driven by the church's own desire to have that stuff, so by their own kind of yeah. greed. Um, but yeah, And to stay a force in the world. Yeah, but it's it's very much pushed off as it is wrong to do what we're doing right now and in, in wanting all this stuff. And he's, he's kind of pushing back and saying, uh, well... 
you can do that, but if if this machine stops, uh, it's going to stop your. It's the machine's driving your yeah your carriage. What you know? I found it, the most interesting about this this was the response to it because uh, you know this this poem you could sit and read the poem in fifteen twenty minutes. It's not mm-hmm. long. But it drove so much controversy. At people attacked him for it that he's forced to write another book responding to his own poem. And while the poem you can read in about twenty minutes, his response to defending it was a two hundred page book. Oh my! Uh, trying I didn't to explain his, his beliefs about this. Uh, so it kind of shows you how how. Uh, fickle this way. I mean, Rousseau responded to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rousseau, of course, we've talk, talked about him before on the mm-hmm. show. Uh, he he believed strongly in the the man, the state of nature would just should just take just what he needs, mm-hmm. and in the state of nature, everything would be fine. And he attacked the materialism at this point. Um, I, I I find it interesting when I'm I'm, I'm reading this. The last part of this is uh, of his poem is the moral. I'm just going to read part of this to you because I find it interesting. It ends with, uh, then leave complaints, fools only strive to make a great and honest hive, to enjoy the world's conveniences, be famed in war, yet live in ease. Without great vices is a vain utopia seated in the brain. So the idea here is, you know, this, this utopia you want, it, it can't exist without, the, without these vices, without mm-hmm. consumerism. Mm-hmm. So I at least found that interesting. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think that... that Consumerism does drive an economy. Well, and it's it's really interesting because this was the big philosophical debate of the time for hundreds of years on whether one should, and even really before consumerism took off and had a name, um, but should you live a a life of, of want and have more, or should you live a life of contentment and never seek out. I mean, th- this goes all the way back to uh, uh, lived in a in a in a barrel. Diogenes. Uh, all the way back to Diogenes yeah, yeah. And, and before. You know, th- these debates were going on. Um, and the tone of this whole debate, uh, the debate still rages on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it's reflected very much so in uh, the the modern idea of of conservatism versus liberalism with the and it doesn't have to line out this way. I could it could go the other way easily, um, but with the the liberals really hearkening back to uh, the ideas of the simple life, and the conservatives going back to this consumerism you know greed argument. But we have accepted this in such uncertain terms that that we don't even realize uh, to the point that the debate has shifted from should we have and want all these things we have to can we have everything we have without the greed it is no longer even a question in the modern dialogue of whether we should have this and this and this is how we should get it Exactly, yeah. which to me is an astonishing shift in the dialogue <laughs> in, in that we've almost settled the question, which is something we rarely do in, in, mm-hmm. in these kinds of debates. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, uh, still, though, let, 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 let's, let's look at this because I found myself moved a long way in this. In, mm-hmm. in this. I, of course, I've always been a big Adam Smith guy. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a big believer in the invisible hand. And reading this kind of, it, 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 it made it made the idea that consumerism is necessary more important to me. Okay. It seems something that is absolutely essential. Um, so I kind of want to explore this a little bit with you and see where you are in this idea. What, what do you think about this? Do you think that consumerism is necessary in capitalism? I, I, I do. Um, it, it, it's, it's very obvious to me. Uh, that if I'm making a product nobody consumes, then I am wasting resources. Um, and so from that perspective, it clearly is needed uh, both for jobs as well as for... Um, gosh, where am I going? Uh, it, it's clearly needed both for jobs and economic growth. Um, however, uh, I do have question about the difference in consumerism for growth's sake and consumerism for consumerism's sake. For instance, um, you know, while we definitely 
uh, need to uh, build better homes or we definitely need to um, have transportation or, or resources of energy, do we really need to have ice, access to ice cream every night? You, you know what I'm saying? At some point, you, you start to get into a cycle of uh, consuming because you've been told to do so. Do we all need to fight over a Tickle Me Elmo? Mm-hmm. Come Black Friday. I mean, and so yeah. I, th- I think I think it is a a very powerful force that has done great good for our society that can be taken to extremes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And I think I think where you can see that, uh, you know, I know we're talking about Black Friday, but but one of the places I think outside of that that you can see consumerism run amok was our housing crisis, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where uh, you, you know you think about about when the uh, uh, when the housing bubble burst back in what like. Oh, was it 08? I don't remember. I remember it was a while back. But when the bubble burst, it was because people were buying houses they couldn't afford with no money down yeah. because of the drive for consumerism. And then they couldn't afford it. Uh, they ended up upside down, walking away from it, and it mm-hmm. created a glut in the market. Yeah, so it drives consumer- global debt. Yeah, so consumerism to an extreme uh, – Avarice to an extreme is bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and that's kind of where I come to with it because I think if you eliminate greed and consumerism uh, altogether, I think that, and and I think for anybody who knows where I stand politically, um, you'll know that I think that uh, capitalism drives innovation. But I think that comes from the point that if you break it all down and you take that greed away, um, it goes so far as um, a lot of the technologies that we've developed we would not have. And I think it goes so far as, like, we would not have invested in health uh, research the way that we have. Um, we wouldn't have really bothered with vaccines. We wouldn't have um, bothered to clean up our streets so that, you know, people weren't living in filth because... You know, you you have this life that you're given, and and um, you shouldn't be so greedy as to want to live forever. Um, and I think that we don't see a lot of the advances that we've seen, even in the healthcare industry, that have resulted in people living longer, healthier lives. Um, I don't think it's just about the stuff that you put in your home, um, but it is about actually the lives that we are able to leave lead all together. Um, and so I think that you're right. There's an extreme side of it where, um, it is detrimental. And I think we're going to probably talk about that to some degree later, but on the, the other extreme, I think that we are still living in, you know, shacks and shitting in the street and, you know, living really short unhealthy poor lives well and and one thing that that i want to touch on later in the poor show quality by the way not poor money wise mm-hmm. is what i meant well, one thing i i really want to touch on later in the show because uh, i i think there's like two versions of consumerism even within this definition that need to be talked about one is the fact that people want to have uh, creature comforts we'll call it mm-hmm. uh in their lives want to live better lives and i think that's a great thing but the other side of it that, that I see a lot in our society that, that I, I have bigger questions about is the glorification of consuming. Yeah. So, for instance, um, the, you know, I, th- I think this, this beer exemplifies it well with $30,000 millionaire. It, I need rims or I need, you know, uh, yeah. these, these, clo- these brand name clothes or I need, I need this mm-hmm. stuff because people in society will value me more. If I consume these objects when those resources could be better used, and it, it really amounts to no more than a peacock's feather in society, so they can try and and, and gain more more status. Well, we have a whole like uh, microcosm of the extreme couponing industry that is all about getting as much shit as you can with as little money as you can. But but one thing that I, I want to tackle in this and, and ask questions about is is there a way that societally we could change our value system, not eliminate the want? Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that that's a possibility. But maybe value production more than consumption. Mm-hmm. Uh, value things like contributions to science. I, I mean, you know, look at Einstein and what he did. Maybe he didn't consume as much, but, you know. But, but what drives production? 
Now, again, you're talking about changing society. In our society, what drives production is consumption. Something is produced because somebody will want, wants to purchase it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's what gives something its value. That's why that, that's why there's not a lot of money spent on, on on certain certain things out there is because there's not a, there's not a market for it. I mean, I agree, I agree, but but I see a difference in wanting to consume something because it benefits you, your family, or society in some way, and wanting to consume something to show that you are powerful enough to consume it. Oh, there great. is a huge and. Agreed. and and, and that's that that societal value I talk about. Whenever look at look at um uh, 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 replace Jay Leno for a little bit, and then Conan O'Brien. Yeah, mm-hmm. when he had that contract, and he's like, "I'm going to go destroy Bugatti because I have this money, and I have three months, and I'm going to you know thumb my nose." Like, was there really? Was now, there a as a society, that? we looked and we cheered and we said, ha ha, this guy just just wasted money because he can do it. But he gave it to the man, yeah. Exactly. But on the other hand, you know, was that the type of society we should be living in? I can see where you're coming from. Uh, uh, again, anything in excess can yeah. be bad. Yeah. Uh, but but I think there's a danger in in, in painting consumerism as bad. And we have people that do that today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think there's a real danger in that, uh, because again, no, no, nothing gets made without it. Yeah. You know, uh, I've made the argument before. You know, that, that about uh, uh, medicines. They talk about how it's it's ridiculous that medicines cost so much because that pill only costs you know eighty bucks to make and you're charging five hundred dollars for it. Well, that pill did, but the first one didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and what drives what drives that market is. It is the consumer for that. If there's no money in it, then nothing gets made. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so, so I agree with the, the the general principle you're espousing there of the, it, something needs to be prof. Something usually needs to be profitable to get done, or at least get done quickly. Things will get done without the profit, but they're a lot slower to move, right? Um, however, uh, that said, I, I think we can look at the other side of it too. Um, because I think one of the bigger complaints in the healthcare industry specifically yeah. is that prices are shielded and not well advertised and get gouged uh, at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely they do. And, you know, so I, I think we can both agree that maybe that pill didn't cost that much and so it needs to be at a price that covers all the research before it while also saying that it is possible that there is price a price gouging of sorts that is hidden in the veil of secrecy that surrounds healthcare, yeah, um, and that somebody could be cheated on a price. I mean, sure they can. I, 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 I think we we have to kind of look at both sides of that. Okay, I don't know what the solution is, but I, I, I okay. I, I mean, transparency and pricing. Well, and I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that this is that show, but yeah, also I, that you know, and and that's actually which uh, I think would drive transparency yeah. and pricing. Yeah, yeah, but but there, there's actually moves uh, right now. They haven't gone through yet, but a lot of um, I've seen commercial on TV where where a lot of pill companies are doing this proactive, knowing it's coming up. Where you have those those pill commercials for you know whatever, and they list all the side effects, and what they're having to do in those commercials is list the price. Huh. Yeah. Just, which I think is a simple, you know, yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Interesting. And so they you do can it in know, a lot of other commercials. Yeah, and so you can know when you ask for that pill, do I want to pay for this? Do I want to ask for a generic? Is it worth it? Because a lot of times what happens is you go to the doctor, they write you a script for something, and you don't find out how much it costs until you're handed a bottle of pills. And they're like, okay, here's $300. You're like, yeah. what? Yeah. 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 You know. You get your bill from the, you go to the doctor and you get a bill six months later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Fuck all I've that. been there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, recently. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. uh, anyway, yeah. uh, but 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 I, I think all of that uh, is off topic, and maybe we need to do uh, a show on the the, oh the consumer Just rights, healthcare. Well, the state of the healthcare system, yeah, but you know, yeah, maybe yeah. consumer rights yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, they're so related. Oh my yeah. God. Um, so I want to ask: Is there is Consumerism does it have a moral component? Is there, is there a, a morality? Um, and and by morality we mean how should a good society function? Uh, a moral component to it, or is it an amoral thing? I think I think consumerism itself is amoral. Um, I think where it becomes amoral is where a lot, or sorry, immoral, is where a lot of things become immoral, and that's at the extremes. 
the extreme of either side of consumerism, a complete lack of it or an overtaking of it um, is where it becomes immoral. I think that, I mean, the same thing applies to, uh, go, well, I, name another fucking activity that people do. And, you know, I don't think okay. necessarily that driving is immoral. Uh, I think driving is amoral, but I think driving recklessly is immoral. But that's the extreme. I would say that consumerism at the at the state level is amoral. It has it has no morality to it. But consumerism at the individual level has a sense of morality to it. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, uh, the the state doesn't need to be telling somebody putting laws in place about consumerism. But as an individual, you shouldn't be going and and buying uh, designer clothes if you can't feed your family. Yeah. Well, so, and, and and anyway, th- that, that's just that, that, no. That's just kind of the direction I I see it. That I, I think it's an individual morality. I, I find myself at a really interesting place with consumerism uh, and morality because I think at its root, uh, consumerism is immoral. I, I I freely admit that. However, I also think that it's it's a very necessary immorality. Um, so, for instance, that's so very beehive-ish of you. Yeah. So, for instance, um, we can we can look and say, in a perfect society, people would still produce the things that create jobs, and people would only take what is the optimal amount for them to take. We can make arguments over whether it's the minimum they need or yeah. whether it's the minimum to drive the economy or whatever that optimum is. But in a perfect society, people would do that. I think this is a band aid we've thrown onto that because we're not, you know, perfectly minded beings. You know, we're messy. And this kind of drives things in a good direction. I very much equate it to objectification. So when somebody looks at somebody and says, I want to use you, uh, you hear a lot of this talked about in conversations about sex and consent, but I think it's done for other reasons, you know, uh, you know, maybe for profit gain or whatever. When you objectify somebody, you look at somebody and say, that happens in sales all day long. You look at somebody and say, I think I can make this much money off of you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and you look at somebody and you say, you're now, you're not a person, you're a tool for my gain. I think that is immoral in nature. However, I do ask how much, uh, how many uh, successful marriages and how much reproduction has been driven by that very immoral act. So then I look at it and say, maybe it's immoral if you look at it from a um, uh, uh, principle-based morality. Gosh, my mind's uh, gone. Oh, God. I don't know where you are. Versus uh, 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 utilitarianism, but De- duty, de- deontology. Duty. De- yes, deontology. thank you. Yeah, from, okay. from Why? A, How did that? I don't know. <laughs> from a deontological point of view, I think it's immoral. But then when you look at it from a, a utilitarian, a, from a utilitarian point of view, it becomes moral. Yeah, so, yeah. so then I have a really interesting question: on where do I fall on that scale? Yeah. Are you are you acting from duty or are you acting from utility? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. it's interesting to me. You want to talk about this beer a little bit before we move on, or is this not a good spot? No, I think this is a, a, a good spot. Um, uh, I went first the last two times. I want Anna to go first. Fine. So uh, anybody who's watching the YouTube video, I hope enjoyed the look on my face when I first sipped this beer. Oh, my fucking God. It is sour. And I like it. I think it tastes really good. Um, but it was alarming how sour yeah. it was. Um so this is brewed with wine yeast, and and I think you can kind of tell that it's it has a it has a dryness that I th- I think it's got is, a wine quality. Yeah, it, it's yeah. not so characteristic of beer. Um, it's funky as fuck, and very little hops. Um, honestly, it's sour enough that the grain profile I think is even kind of muted. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's fruity. I would I would almost say it's leaning like toward tasting like just a really sour cider. Yeah. Um but I've enjoyed it. So I'm gonna give it a three point two. Okay. Me or you. Holy Go shit, ahead. you guys All didn't right. freak out at my rating. No, actually I think your uh, your your uh, rating is, is 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 fairly close. I I like this beer. It is a sour. Uh it's it's not uh you, you talked about how sour it was. I have had a lot of sour beers that are more sour than this, yeah. but it's but it's more than I expected. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's got a uh, it's got the, it's got a fruity overtone in there that I like. Um, 
Oh, it's a gorgeous beer. The too. smell is uh, the smell's fantastic. good. Uh, I, I'm really a fan of this beer. I think it's a. Uh, I, th- I think it'd be a good summer beer. It's not a great winter beer. Right. Um, I, I'm going to go about the same place you are. Maybe a little higher. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go three four. Okay. Okay. So I'm actually going to come a little lower on this. Um, I think y'all both described it beautifully as far as being a sour goes. I think it's a great sour. Anyone who is out there tasting the funk, I think this is a, a great one to try. <laughs> However, where I think they feel short is I think it's a bit basic. I think they they made a great sour beer that and they but they could have done so much more with mm-hmm. it. Um, that said, it's still a good beer. I like it. Um, it's it's a little bit different than than your average beer, but that's just kind of what you expect when you go with that's what a I sour like about beer. It, though that's what I like about um, it. I think they could have. Um Added a bit of a spice profile. Yeah, that's and it exactly been, what I was going to say. Yeah, it, it would have made given it a lot of complexity. It needs some spice, uh, maybe even some woody tones in there. That would be nice. Uh, that would have made it more of a wintry beer. It would. Yeah, uh, it would. But, but as a summer beer, I think it's, a, it's it's got a good flavor. I think it does. So with all that said, I'm going to go a little bit lower. But I, again, I don't think you're far from any. I'm, I'm going to go with a straight three. Okay. okay. I think they could have done much better, but yeah. they didn't do bad. Yeah. 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 So good I've beer. Much better. Enjoyed. Much better than the ugly can. Oh yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> we almost didn't get it because the can, but because it felt it fits so well with the theme, we went yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah. So. but um, yeah, I, I've I've really liked the beer, but interestingly, because it's so sour, it's a slow drinker. It is a slow mm. drinker. Like yeah. I've I keep wanting to drink it faster, but my mouth needs like a moment to reset. Well, let's play our game. All right. Um, if she tells you she likes warheads, this will get you laid. Um. It'll make her make that pucker face, too. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Which is perfect. Yeah. That's what you want. Um, but I think this has got to be somebody who either really likes sour things or um, is an avid beer adventurer. Yeah, yeah. Um, an explorer. There yes. you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And with that said, I, I'm going to go with a mix-it-up beer. Uh, this is something that you, you want to try when you want to do something new. You're a little bit more secure in the relationship. Uh, this also uh, would be a great flight beer, you know, to, yeah. to, to add to oh, your, I think your that, flight. I think it would be perfect for a flight beer, yeah. But um, I, I'm not going to bring this out on a first date. I'm not going to try and, you know, uh, throw a Hail Mary on this it's one. not a weed out. No, no. It, the, and I'm not going to break up with anyone on this one. So I, it's definitely a change it up beer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm in a rough situation because I find this beer very refreshing. I think it would be good in a, on the summer day when you're mowing the lawn, but you can't drink it fast enough for a lawnmower beer. So it's not a lawnmower beer. It's almost. Uh, it's almost a lawnmower beer. I think this is, uh, you know, after you finish mowing the lawn and you're sitting on the porch enjoying your yard, this is when you're drinking this. Yeah, so, fair enough. Uh, kind of, kind of where I that. am there. Uh, Again, I think it's more of a summer beer. I don't think you want to drink this on a, on a, on a cool day. Yeah. But uh, that's just kind of where I am with it. But an outstanding beer. Uh, if you haven't tried this, go uh, go give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, Noble Ray's done all right. Yeah, they have. Yeah, they they, have. Have. Uh, like they just, they're just ugly cans. Ugly yeah. cans. They're like uh, right next to Well, house. and they keep doing this. Uh, this. So anyone watching the YouTube can see like the cans are actually meant to be stacked. So half the image is on one side and half is on the other. I actually know, because I've seen enough Noble Ray cans, that that goes on. But if you see the can, not knowing that, it looks weird. It, it does. does. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. It's, uh, it's a little bit. It looks like a Country Time Lemonade can to me. I mean, yeah, it, it kind of does. I keep thinking it's, it's lemonade. but uh. So, I like when the ver- show first started, I was taking notes about it. Um, and one of the notes I have in here says it's so carbonated, it's so, almost sparkly. And when we did first pour it, it was very carbonated. And you it could just them. see it. It does. Yeah, it's, it's it's almost almost flat now. Yeah, um, but it was just bubbling like crazy, and it was like popping on the top. It was really pretty. Yeah, yeah. I wish I'd gotten a video of that. So, yeah. um, I, I have one more thing I want to talk about, and then I think there were some things Anna had said she wanted to to cover mm-hmm. in this. Um, but uh, the last one is is kind of a a, a tangent to this, but I I think they they relate really well. And that's human rights. So we've talked about how, uh, uh, in previous shows, how a lot of things have been deemed human rights that historically just weren't, you know, pretty new concepts. And what we tend to see in this, at least as far as as my my looking at it has shown, um, is that what we see becoming a human right were like 
the first things that consumerism drove, the, the, the most important needs. And then we've kind of taken them for granted now. And now we, we've said, okay, well, we've so taken them for granted. It's a human right. We, we have to, like, give this to everybody. Like how in Texas, um, it is part, it is the requirement of the landlord that you have air conditioning in your, in your unit. Right. Where in, like, New England, in l- lots of Europe, like, air conditioning is just not a thing you really do at all. Yeah. Of course, they're much cooler climates. But, like, here, that is considered a necessity at this point. And, yeah. And almost, a, it's a renter's right, I guess, yeah. we would yeah. call it. But something, I'm not living somewhere without it. I'm just saying. Right? I know. <laughs> but something interesting that we've seen from this whole thing is it almost seems like whenever we turn something into a human right, it almost seems to flounder as an industry, right? Uh, whether we're talking about health care, whether we're talking about housing, nobody wants to live in the free housing. And, and even to some extent, we've seen when it became a human right, the housing industry... Uh, catering toward that because it was kind of free money out there. So I want to kind of talk about, and then we have other industries that are completely not considered human rights, like uh, shoe companies and McDonald's and, you know, ice cream or whatever you can say. And these tend to be things that are less necessities and much more luxuries. Yet if we look at the market numbers, those things tend to do much better financially, which means much more consumed than the human rights tend to do. So my question is, does taking something out of consumerism and moving it to a human right actually have a detrimental effect on it to the point that we might want to say, maybe McDonald's should be a human right so we (laughs) won't have so much, you know? Oh my goodness. Well, I I think that goes back to the, the, just the human condition of, of greed, I think. And, uh, to me, it would be natural to expect that whenever you make something a human right, mm-hmm. that you're taking that that part of the factor out, and that's gonna you're taking the invisible hand out that's mm-hmm. gonna affect the market. Uh, you're you're playing with with the natural tendencies you're of the market. Taking the driver out of the car. Yeah, and 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 that's that's gonna create without issues. having a driver in this car. It's gonna create issues. So. Well, and and you know you, you you say you're 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 taking the driver out of the car, but I I think it's much more. Yeah, sorry, I don't know if you guys at home can hear that, but uh, so. The cat has our, apparently decided it's bitching time. Yeah, oh, okay. our producer's saying it's not coming through on the audio, so okay. we're good. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the, the cat's going crazy the next time. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, um, I, I think of it much more as you have this uh, large sector of traffic, let's say the trucking industry, and you've sat there and said this is being driven by thousands of people, you know, moving goods around, and you've now said, you know what? All those poor people shouldn't have to drive these trucks. Why don't we have one guy at a control console driving them all at the same time? Yeah. And then you see like the disaster that ensues when this convoy of trucks comes, <laughs> you know, crashing down the road. Um, and and you you know we we've we've kind of taken that 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 random everybody making your own decision out of it. Uh, and a lot of times we do this through price control. Interestingly enough, uh, which which largely de-incentivizes the producers of these things yeah, to look look at uh, how uh rent control has uh, has affected your big cities new york places like oh, yeah. that where where you know there's there's no housing now because yeah. there's no there's no uh there's no motivation for it yeah, yeah. And, and you know b- people people complain about the high cost of housing and you know it's a really interesting effects that uh, effect that happens where when you price control things the complaints go down but we see when we uh, when we look at it, the, the complaints aren't going down because people are thrilled with the price. It's because they don't have anywhere to pay. Yeah. Like you can't complain about a price for a bill you don't have because yeah. you don't have housing yeah. anymore. Yeah. 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 Um, so what do y'all think? I mean, should we have any human rights uh, from, from that perspective? Or uh, is it a detrimental thing? Or is it a good thing? Because maybe, uh, you know, we did a show on housing recently and, and yeah. maybe that's kind of something we need. Well, I I think you can still have human rights. I think the problem comes in when you have consumable human rights. Well, I think it's it, it, it's a matter of expansionism. You know, when, whenever uh, our natural rights were defined by John Locke as life, liberty, and property, mm-hmm. okay, I'm okay with that. But when our natural rights start getting redefined, uh, you know, as – uh, you know, you have a right to health care, you have a right to a house, you have a right to have an air conditioner in your house. That's something Do not different. ever 
No, please, nobody ever assert a right to coffee. If you disrupt my coffee supply, we are going to have problems. Yeah. Everybody will have coffee. No, we'll all be folders. <laughs> <laughs> that hurt, yeah, There will be a pot of folders there. in every house. Oh. That hypothetical hurt. Fuck you, let's make it right to beer. No, let's not. What are you doing? It will all be Bud Light John. and every bridge will have beer. <laughs> what are you doing? God, kill, Don't listen to him. Kill me Nobody now. listen to him. Um, a right to a right to podcast. Everybody, everybody can have their own show. Doesn't everybody already have their own show? Everybody does it. <laughs> yeah, Hell, yeah, we've think, got one. I think that's already a thing, actually. <laughs> um, okay. Well, that was kind of everything I had on consumerism. I know there were some points that that you said you want to talk about, uh, and I see Mike here. You have something on fast fashion, so I let uh, y'all. No, that's mine. Oh, that's you. Okay, you put under Mike. Oops. Anyway, uh, anyway, but hey Mike, yeah. you want to talk about fast fashion? Absolutely. What the hell is it? <laughs> no. Um, so this was actually something that I've I've kind of been looking at for a few months now. Um, and I find it really interesting. I actually expected it to kind of fit better into the show somewhere than it it seems to have. Um, That's but, interesting. So fast fashion essentially is this. Uh, there used to be, first of all. Um, essentially four seasons in the fashion industry. You had spring, summer, fall, winter. Strangely enough, they corresponded with the weather. Um, but the fashion industry has expanded that so much that you're seeing new lines coming out every week, two weeks, maybe a month. Um, in fact, back when I was working in clothing retail, we literally – did a full changeover of the fashions in the store once a month. Um, and from what I understand, it's it's only gotten worse since then. That's pretty common, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I started kind of looking into it. And um, one of the things that I found was that uh, Americans are buying 400% more clothes per year um, than we were back in the 1980s. That's not me. Yeah, no, it's not me. <laughs> That's what I was thinking because like... Um, so I was, I was talking to you earlier, like I've, I've decided I'm going with a capsule wardrobe. My clothes, all of my clothes fit in the space of about a foot and a half, maybe in the closet. I don't have that, <laughs> but I've got years and years of clothes. So yeah. I have to get rid of, you know, maybe I do fit into that the more I think about it. Okay. Go ahead. I, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about it now, but, um, they say that the average American buys 71 new pieces of clothes a, a year. That's um, which is about one a week. Now, a lot of people aren't buying one every week. Yeah. You know, they'll go out and buy six or seven at a time. Um, but that was kind of the thing I was thinking about was for all the people that aren't doing that, how many clothes are these, are the other, the people on the other side of that average, um, buying, like it's a fucking ton. I'm thinking you know, to myself, I buy, uh, at the start of every work year from when I, when I go to school, I go buy four or five new sets of clothes to mm -hmm. get me through the year. And kind of mix them, and that's pretty much the clothes I buy for the year. Yeah, uh, that and, and very expensive boots. But you know, other than <laughs> yeah. that, you know, I, I think about it now. Here's what I don't do: I mm -hmm. don't do like the new fashion, and I'm gonna right. go get. But I, I, I actually have quite a few clothes, and, and the reason is I have three kinds of clothes that I have full sets for. Mm -hmm. One is my uh, work clothes. One is my dress clothes. And what is my casual clothes? Yeah. And I use them for different aspects of my life, uh, uh, whether it be with a party, my job, or, you know, just, you know, going casually around. And and I look at it, and I, I do kind of have those. And, you know, I'll, I'll go out, and maybe I'll, I'll put on some weight or lose some weight and have to, okay, we got to get more, you know, what because your suit has to fit right. Yeah. Or it's yeah. it's yeah. useless. Um, and I'll, I'll go out, and so I... I, I May fall into that seventy-one pieces per year. When I was really involved in politics, I probably was there. Yeah, because yeah, I buy a new suit every, you know, yeah, a couple of new suits a year. But then I have shirts that are like ten years old that yeah. you know people give me hell about. It's like yeah. you still own that. Yeah, mostly me giving you yeah. hell about it. Yeah, uh, well, or my mother-in-law, kind of... you know. <laughs> yeah. Me with that one. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. See, it's a thing. My, my wardrobe drives conversation. Yes, it does. It does. Um, but so one of the things that they talk about in transitioning to a capsule wardrobe um, is not even it's not even necessarily like an anti-consumerism thing, just kind of like an easy life thing. Yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things that they talk about is buying more durable um, items of clothing. And that's actually 
in stark contradiction to this fast fashion, fast fashion that we're seeing now. You're seeing stores like Forever 21 um, that are selling T-shirts for four dollars. Yeah. Um, or Walmart. That or, you wear twice and throw yeah, away. Yeah, exactly. Like you wear them a handful of times, and all of a sudden they've got holes in them. And so that was something. As I started looking more and more into this. Um, people are starting to ask the question, where are all of these clothes going to? Because once it's, because nobody knows how to sew anymore. Um, you know, and so when it's got holes in it, I your throat, uh, very few people, I can sew, you can sew. We probably yeah. know a handful of people that can sew, but the vast majority of people can't. Um, we have gotten so specialized that a lot of those, um, those skills are yeah. outsourced to other people or it's not affordable to do it. It's, it's cheaper it, to buy a new suit. Exactly. New because I can go, if I couldn't sew, I could go and take a, an item of clothing to the dry cleaner or a seamstress. But if it's a $4 t-shirt, it's going to cost me more to get it fixed yeah. than it is to just go get a new one. Yeah. Um, We're not darning socks anymore. What's darning? We're not patching holes in socks anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, Grandpa. Well, that's true. <laughs> but anyway... Um, uh, but yeah, so the stuff is also cheap that you're just going and getting something new and you're throwing it out. They start looking at where these clothes are actually going to. And even, uh, one of the things they found is even when you're say donating them to uh, goodwill or the salvation yeah. army or the crisis center, a lot of those places are one, they're getting way more clothes than they actually need that, um, this idea of sending your clothes to, uh, the less fortunate they don't we want are your consuming either. so many clothes yeah. that there's a surplus there. Um, and not only that, but so they'll go through all the clothes that you're sending in and all that, all that fast fashion with holes in it that literally is, is thin enough. You can almost see through it. Um, they're throwing that out because it's useless. They can't, it cannot be sold again. <coughs> and so a lot of it is ending up in landfills. Well, one of the things that some of these um, these fast fashion brands are actually starting to do is promote people to bring their old clothes back into the store um, to donate them. And presumably it is to recycle them or give them to the needy. Only 1% of of the material that is actually getting brought in is being recycled because of the materials that it's made of. Yeah. And because whenever you recycle it, even things like cotton and wool, it, whenever you recycle it, it's not as strong it the second weaker. time yeah. around. Yeah. Um, and so what I found to be fascinating is that in places like the U S and Canada and Europe, all of these extra clothes are disappearing. They're not going where we think that they're going. They're actually going to places like Africa. Yeah. And destroying the economies they don't there. Fucking, yeah, they're destroying the economies there yeah. because the textile industries there cannot compete with free, with clothes those people got for free. Yeah. Um, or sorry, there's actually a big company that's contributing to a lot of this that's selling them, but they're selling them at a, at a really, really discounted rate yeah. um, so that the textile industries can't compete. And we're actually kind of turning these places into our secondary landfills because they go through and they go, this is all shit. Like I can't sell these clothes because they're already halfway destroyed and they're fucking worthless. And so they literally are taking them out behind their markets and, and either just piling them up or burning them. Um, so, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier or I was talking earlier about the extreme side of consumerism. And I think that is actually where our, not just with clothes, um, but I think that's where our culture can actually start to shift toward a healthier version of consumerism if we pay attention to what happens when we're done with it. I want clothes. I want comfortable clothes. I want enough clothes that I don't have to worry about things. I don't want clothes because the sun came up a little earlier today. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I do want to ask, though, uh, uh, bring things back around to that kind of peacocking uh, uh, value effect of if you consume more, you're a more valuable member of society. Right. 
does that mentality have any value? I mean, does somebody consuming more, uh, Jeff Bezos having enough money to do whatever he wants, actually tell us something in society about that person and help us make better, more rational decisions about who we choose in a mate or or how valuable they really are? You know, Is that a valuable thing or is that some kind of mirage that we've built? Well, I think that's an interesting thing. Um, when you talk about like the difference between old money and new money mm -hmm. and I can't remember who it is, but it's some dude that was like famously wealthy, um, who I think is dead now. Um, that would be most wealthy of people <laughs> tend to die. People tend to die. Yes. Well, I was about to add in that poor happen. people tend to die too. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, but he like, he lived in a house that he bought for like $50,000, um, a, a decent house, but not. you bought a house cheaper than mine. It was also a long time ago. <laughs> okay, you talk about Warren Buffett. <laughs> Maybe I yeah. said is it Warren Buffett? Yeah, it's Warren Buffett. He's not dead. He 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 still lives in a house Almost. he bought in the 1950s Maybe. that was ne next to nothing. He still drives an old beat up pickup yeah. truck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But they are they're not going and blowing their money on all of this consumer stuff. Um, it's not what you make; it's what you don't spend. Yeah. Well, and and you see that. Um, even if you look in our own community at the old money versus the new money, um, old money is driving cars for longer periods of time. Yeah. Um, you know, they are fixing up their old house, not buying a new one. Um, and, and they show up to eat, not at the nicest restaurants, but if they go out to eat, they're showing up in like a t-shirt or a polo and They're going jeans. to Sadler's. And yeah. yeah, you know, they're not... Uh, mid great restaurant, but not, yeah. not you not know... Not expensive. Yeah, yeah, but they're not wearing Gucci belts and uh, kiss me jeans or miss me jeans. I don't even know. <laughs> um, I like the kiss me jeans. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and, and... Do they work? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what they're called. Um if but, they're not called Kiss Me Jeans, I'm making those. I'm yes. just letting you know. Charge like $500 a piece for them. $500 a pair. Yes. And they're going to last two weeks. And you need to consume them regularly. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, they have a use-by date. But I, I do think that there's an element of that that goes with new money versus old money. You want to show how successful you are. Um, and eventually I think you go, this is dumb. I shouldn't be doing this anymore. Yeah. Because I, consumerism is fucking exhausting. So I, I don't know if we got to, to the heart of my question. Is there value to it? I don't know. Um, I, 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 think, I think the value is economic. I don't think the value is, is, is a moral value. I think there's an economic value to consumerism. Well, I mean, okay. So, so, so I agree. I'm not really talking yeah. about morality here. But I'm asking, okay, I go to the club. And I see some girl buying like expensive champagne and and wearing a way overpriced yeah, outfit. You can't afford that. her. Yeah. Right. Well, but I mean, yeah. maybe she can't afford me. <laughs> but, uh, but I say, you know, that is somebody I want to pursue more yeah, no. than than this person in the corner. Is that a valuable thing in our society? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think it's. I think that's damaging to uh, relationships. I I think it is. I think it's something that we do value. Yeah. Um. I think that it's a flawed measure of value, though. Okay. Well, I would agree with that. I think it's something that we do, but I don't think it's a true value. I, Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, this is, this is really... So the other side of that is... Um, the, the interesting side is, while it doesn't seem to be useful, you know, going back to the, the 1800s, uh, having a taller wig doesn't make you a better person, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, and I was... Um, I was at, go ahead. But... What it has been incredibly useful at is with um, companies using psychology to drive sure, these sure. mentalities to get us to buy more things, which in theory drives the economy. Yeah. Yeah. So is like the fantasy, maybe it's no good for actually finding a good mate and maybe it's no good for you being frugal and saving money and becoming the millionaire because most people don't want to have a million dollars. They want to spend a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe it does nothing for that. And it's all a big deceit that we're running, but it's good for the economy. So yeah. is that then OK? Sure. Sure. I think I think that's exactly where I fall. Your I society's full, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think it's good for the economy. Yeah. Um, for a little while, I think there's a danger to it. You can, yeah. I mean, we've seen the danger of it. it People get go, trampled. It can go too far with, you know, housing bubble, yeah. uh, tulips, uh, yeah, pineapples, yeah. you know, whatever it is. You can create a bubble with this really. Yeah, you, you can have people living on the side of the road of like, I won the lottery and I won $600 million and now I'm broke. Yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah. What, what happened? Yeah. 
Well, I ha- I had to consume things. That yeah. was, you know, what I needed yeah. to do. But interestingly, I think that consumerism in our society is actually, it is, I think, driven by latent Calvinism. The idea that the wealthier you are, amen, the better a person you are, amen, and you exhibit how good a person you are by the things that you buy. So are you agreeing with her statement or with the idea that... No, can- I, I'm agreeing with her statement. I've, okay, said, okay. I've said for a long time that a lot of our problems are uh, are, are vestiges of Puritanism, and, and, okay. and that's, where, that's where a lot of that comes from. Yeah. All right. yeah. That comes right out of my lecture in, 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 in school, so I, I, I appreciated hearing that. Nice. Wait, what? What you just said, I, I lecture on that in my, my oh, history class. Cool. So that's interesting. Have you been to his history class? No, but oh. she's heard me talk a lot. <laughs> he does talk Fair a enough. lot. Fair enough. Um, but I actually think that we are um, kind of shifting out of that phase. I, I th- don't. I think we are. And we can disagree there. I, I, I think we're... and, and I, I've seen in, in, in regional places, for instance, uh, uh, minimalism is huge in Japan right now. Um, but... I, I think we may be shifting in or out of it. I don't. I don't really look at it enough right now to say mm-hmm. we are. But I think if we are, we're we're on like. I mean, it's come and gone. It's on a hump. I don't it think has. it's a long term. That, you know, that's, that's that's kind of where I was thinking. You know? yeah. I, I think we may be in a wave where, you know, when the economy's good, we're, we we do yeah. one thing. When the economy's bad, we do another. And that may very well be the case. Um, and uh, oddly enough, we tend to do them backwards of what we yeah. should. Right. <laughs> so, uh, right. Um, but I do think that what is happening right now is a shift away from the idea that the more money you have, the better person you are. Because I think we're seeing a lot of examples of people who are shit human beings that also have a lot of money. Hashtag me too. Uh, yeah. Wow. What? It, it, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you, you see where I'm going. Okay, yeah. I do. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Well, I'm this so was... glad you didn't say the other thing. Oh, pound me too? Damn it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That's for our older listeners. Wow. <laughs> With a lot of money, who like to? I am very much laughing at this right now. Yeah. All right. So anyway. I'm not an older listener. Yeah. Only because you don't listen. That's because I don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, anything else? I don't think so. I think I think we covered it really well. Awesome. Um, okay. Did we come to any conclusions? No. 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 Okay. But that that that's the you know that shows it's a good philosophical question. My conclusion, question. yeah, is that consumerism is not the ultimate evil, though it can be an evil. A necessary evil is kind of where I fall. You can you come know? to that. Go buy shit. Yeah. Okay. But not too much. <laughs> from me. From, from uh, our store. I, I, I'm going with go buy shit. Where, and, and where yeah. could they buy shit? Uh, on Teespring. Um, go to teespring.com slash stores slash six pack philosophy. And maybe we'll put some new swag out. There is some cool swag on there. We I should put some today. like Black Friday consumerism stuff up just for Black Friday. I can probably do that. Yeah, let's get that out. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that. I got work to do. Make that cool. Make so, really yeah, cool. I'm apparently putting up Black Friday shit. <laughs> Have fun. Buy it. Uh, we'll do a discount. I bought this shirt. We'll do a it, discount. <laughs> I bought this shirt because it makes me a better person. There you go. Oh, my God. Yes. So anyway, um, we have nothing else on consumerism. We've enjoyed it, and we hope you have too. Don't forget to like, heart, share, subscribe, whatever way you can indicate your like for the show on the platform that you're on. Hit us up on social media. If you've got any shows you want to see us do, let us know. We do do, yes, I said do do, um, listener requests. We've done several lately. They've been a we lot have. of fun. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm going to say it one more time. We've enjoyed it, and we hope you have too. Cheers. 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 Don't get trampled on Black Friday. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 